Well, well, well. Look who finally matured. Look who stopped rolling their eyes back up all the way so you can see nothing but white and saying, Put me the child! on a first date at Stewart's Root Beer. FRS, BRZ, GR86, whatever your name is now, you're still here. You're a cross-manufactured build designed for a generation who'd never had the money for a new car anyway. You even survived your original make. Scion is gone, but you, whatever your name is now, you're still here. Still being made. Still preserving manual transmissions. Funny how a Subaru-powered Toyota brew managed... You're underpowered, too. You're an underpowered sports car. And you went from being an automotive oddity to joining the Mazda MX-5 as the gold standard for affordable sports cars. But it doesn't make enough power. I want 300 horsepower. I want 400 horsepower. I paid you $500 on OnlyFans. The least you could do is RP with me. I demand you RP with me and include these custom kinks. Number one, slut shaming. Number two, penis humiliation. Number three, locker room scenes. Number four, kissing. Number five, canon characters. Number six, dragon heart in a modern setting. Number seven, underwear bulges. Number eight, elder scrolls in a modern setting. Number nine, pregnancy. 2022 Toyota GR86. It's good. There. You wanted me to say it? Here you go. It's good. Really good. Might even be one of the better cars in the Toyota lineup right now. It's amazing. Perfect. Beautiful. Majestic. It holds me at night until I fall asleep and reads to me from the Book of Fables. Open the throttle and hear God's voicemail. corner with the confidence of a man who knows his way of life is guaranteed for the next 30 years. Cruise with the relief of blue balls regaining their color. Your lap hog still stands at attention with a single thought, and all is right with the world in your Toyota GR86. More like Toyota GR8 dicks. Eight dicks. Eight dicks. Eight dicks. Eight dicks. Eight dicks. Eight dicks, eight dicks, eight dicks, eight dicks, eight dicks, eight dicks. So why don't I want one? Toyota made this car as a continuation of the 8.6 heritage. Or from my perspective, insisted this car is part of the 8.6 heritage. While presenting a finished product that invokes almost nothing about its best example. You see, the 8.6 was originally introduced as the Sports 800, released in 1965 as a way of getting their consumers into two-seat sports cars. This eventually culminated in your anime favorite, AE86, the best version in the lineup, and a car that offered the high Toyota had been chasing ever since. Waiku doke is the Japanese term that basically means heart-pumping excitement. It's all about that adrenaline rush, the power of anticipation and the allure of a good thrill that's just around the corner. And yet, by creating a fun, curated driving experience, Toyota had effectively removed some of the unwieldy and unpredictability of the original AE86. A fun car is at its most fun when it's unruly. The original AE86 is not fast. Yes, it has a high rev line, and yes, it was good for the 80s, but it's not quick. You have to be a maniac to make the original AE86 Sprinter Truino drive quickly. It's an easy car to drive, very difficult to master. I suppose you could say it's a car that's at its best when it challenges you. The GR86 doesn't really do that. Everything it does is open to you from the jump, like playing a video game on your older brother's save file. All the secret characteristics and abilities are already unlocked. 
Sure, I'll still have fun playing, but there won't be any sense of accomplishment. Toyota presented this as an analog car for the digital age, and I'll get into that later. I'm not sure if we've ever moved past the need for analog cars. The threadbare honesty of vehicles that privilege the drive over creature comforts. This is a very comfortable car. It's a fine long-distance cruiser despite its small size. A real fun car is about the tactile experience. The feel, the sound, the rush. The... This car gets some of those aspects spot on, while others leave a lot to be desired and have to be modded for you to get that. For every razor's edge corner you take, you have drawbacks like a stock throttle tune that's basically a hall monitor trying to keep you from walking too fast to lunch. You better watch out or they'll make you walk all the way back to your classroom and then walk back to the cafeteria. So, out of the box, Toyota's throttle, or Subaru's throttle, depending on... Uh, when you go, say the light turns green, you go full mash. Wide open throttle. Your foot is all the way to the floor, but that throttle hasn't matched your foot movement. So you go, whamp, full on the pedal, and that throttle goes one Mississippi two, Mississippi three, Mississippi full. The idea is to preserve the car and also meet EPA regulations. Jay fixed that with a throttle controller, not a boost controller, a throttle controller. Something that says, hey, when I push my pedal down, open that throttle body all the way. And once you do that, now you have some 90s style back, like original mechanical throttles. When you go full throttle, you get full throttle. So now when you crank that thing all the way up, there's three settings on it. When you crank it all the way up, this thing, oh, there's that 90s style I missed. Oh, that's, that's, that's snappy. Yeah. I went to three. Yeah, you feel the difference. Oh, hey now. Yeah. So this is the third GR model after the GR Supra and GR Yaris, with a starting MSRP for the premium trim around $31,800. Takes 93 octane, max speed of 140 miles an hour, zero to 60 time of 6.1 seconds, fuel economy, 21 city, 31 highway, 25 combined. It's all a byproduct of the engine, the FA24, or the 2.4 liter FA24 Subauru boxer engine. Makes out of the box about 277 horsepower and people are still complaining that it's not 300. That's not the point of this car. The point is to go full throttle and not die. So there are a number of changes to compensate for the higher engine output, thinner cylinder liners, improved water jacket, resin material for the rocker cover to replace aluminum, stronger connecting rods, D4S fuel injection, greater linear torque delivery, improved air intake, new fuel pump design for consistent flow while cornering, a high-speed water pump, and a water-cooled oil cooler. This is before even getting to the exhaust system, which features a new 5.6 liter center pipe that generates a growl, I guess, under acceleration that gets amplified by an active sound control system that sends sound directly into the cabin. Knock it off. Stop it. No more artificial engine sounds. I want to hear what the engine sounds like. I don't need boomer noises coming out of these speakers. And here is how to make the active sound control shut up. Okay, okay so where is it? Is it? Should be hanging somewhere. So this right here? Yeah. This plugs in right into this port right here. When you plug this in, you'll have that really like fake engine noise pump through the speakers and it's really like loud too so you can't just not hear it but all you got to do is pull that pull this out done. and it's out oh hell yeah so the active noise is or in this case was a number of features that look fine on a spreadsheet yet overwhelming in sheer information volume it has 12 and a half to one compression ratio. It has a torsion limited slip diff. It has McPherson struts and a multi-link rear. It has the GR circuit tuned coil spring, shock absorbers, and iron front knuckles. It has the rear suspension member mounted stabilizer bar. It has a GR circuit timed electric power steering pump on a power assisted rack and pinning. Look, it's all good. It's all neat. It's all nice and all necessary. It's all so nice. In fact, that it seems designed to make you feel like a dick for not liking it. And I feel it. I like the GR86. I don't love the GR86. But honestly, most of the real substance comes from the things that Jay added. 
His modifications include new exhaust, new brakes, in addition to a dual resonator. That electric throttle controller that makes a world of a difference, and it gets you power all the way to 4,000 RPM, or rather it gets you improved throttle response all the way to 4,000 RPM. It still has the torque dip, but that dip flattens out. The torque isn't gradual, it's sudden, almost like an S2, well, I compare this to an S2000. That's a big comparison. Now I'm comparing a car from the early 2000s from a car from 2022. But I feel, despite of everything, a GR86 is better than an S2000. I'll say that again. This is better, a better car than an S2000. An S2000, people will expect things from you. They will expect you to rev. You will have hecklers. You will have jealous eyes. You will worry about an S2000 wherever you park. An S2000, because of its scarcity, and it also appeared in Initial D, it has a fan base. The GR86 doesn't. You can park a GR86 anywhere. Toyota GR86, the automotive equivalent of a friend who never lets you pick up the tab. It's cool of them, but at a certain point, you have to wonder if they're just being kind or if they don't think you're capable of paying. By claiming a heritage through the 86 name, it creates a set of expectations which are further amplified by the inclusion of the GR title. It's named for Gazoo Racing, Toyota's performance wing. And the idea here is that you have something that, like the Mitsubishi FTO, isn't made for pedestrian American roads. This is backed up by the fact that every GR86 purchase comes with a free, non-transferable, quote, high-performance driving event, basically a track day. You might not get to a, to a track under this car's normal circumstances, which means you're potentially leaving a lot of the purpose for this car's existence on the table. But if you're offered a free track day, you might be more incentivized to give this a shot. Although, if you've already bought this car, Toyota is like preaching to the choir. But then word of mouth on a car like this can be worth the equivalent cost of a free track day and a one-year membership in NASA. Not that NASA, the National Auto Sport Association, who, despite being founded in 1991, still decided to use those initials and created a motto to hang a lampshade on in the confusion. We're the race guys, not the space guys. The body shell is 50% stiffer while also being significantly lighter, thanks to aluminum components such as the roof, hood, and front fenders, which offset the heavier weight of the new engine and safety features. It also utilizes elements of the modular unibody Subaru Global platform, which has been kicking around since the fifth generation Impreza of 2016. It gets you improved stability, reduced body roll, lower center of gravity, and increased rigidity. At the end of the day, I guess it comes down to how much the heritage of the 8.6 actually matters. And I know that's a random thing to get hung up about it, but when you invoke a legacy, the end result has some responsibility to live up to it. Put all your eggs in one basket and eventually you're going to get shells in your omelet. Terrible analogy. But if you try to make your car appear to be something it isn't, the bill is going to come due sooner or later. Then again, from a devil's advocate standpoint, most modern Mustangs have nothing to do with the originals beyond the general spirit. And even then, you have people understandably argue that point. So is it fair to judge the 8.6 for sharing the name with the AE86 while not living up to it? Even if it ultimately succeeds in being a great car in every other aspect? Probably not. But then it's an issue that's sociological in origin. There's a power in naming things. Sometimes the name fits, and other times we construct reality by ramrodding undefined elements into a knowable order. It's not an 8.6. But it's a fun performance car. But then isn't that what would have made it an 8.6? Intellectually, this should hit the spot, and yet I'm left feeling unfulfilled. It's a familiar sensation to anyone who's ever gotten rooked by that fine point. Yes, it's an 8.6, but also no, it's not. But who cares? If the car's good, it's good. And this car is great.